But first, we're going to... Udi and Dana. Reshet and Keshet have, are going to seven days a week in Israel. They're no more Channel 2. Uh, is this good for the Israeli directors, producers, and talent? Well, you're a producer, I think that's... Uh, well, you're an executive, but... Yeah. I love how there's like an equal number of Israelis. What? There's an equal number of Israelis and Americans, but more lawyers than anything right. else. Is that like a prerequisite? Um, is it a good thing? I think it's a great opportunity. Um, we have to see how you know the financials kind of end up. Right now, there's a mad dash for ratings. Everybody's spending a ton of money, but I think uh, from a producing perspective, it's probably a great time to be in the business. Getting better. I think it's good because there'll be a lot more programs for us to sell in America. Yeah. If you go to seven days Absolutely. a week. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll ask the two of you another question. Um, besides formats and creative talent, are there things that Israel can provide? Television wise or just television wise? <laughs> it's just strictly television. Me? I mean, pro producers, directors. Uh, uh, Israel television is quite young. It's something like 26 years of experience because before we had no commercial channels. So I think that now um, Israeli creators and television can offer um, young and uh, enthusiastic creators um, unique. Who are, you, who are used to working for cheap? Right. I also think if yep. you okay, can so produce shows in Israel I don't that, like to say that's it, not for Israel. So for instance, the greenhouse takes place in San Diego, but it's shot in Israel. So the low cost of production is also great that people here should be aware of when they're thinking of where to shoot their shows. Yeah, I think uh, we had the experience because of our uh, limits. Uh, Sometimes I thought that when you have, uh, when you really have a small box, you must think outside, outside of the box. So we are, had a lot of experience with uh, small budget and still not to give up and uh, to do projects in worldwide uh, standard. So I think we are a force of uh, professional people, creators and uh, production experience that really can do much more in a bit less. Thank you. Zaki, did you ever think that uh, people would be watching you all over the world in a show that's a Hebrew language show? Did any of you ever think that Israeli television shows would be watched all around the world, not in the format, but actually in the linear, linear version, actually in Hebrew? No. <laughs> that was the short answer. Um, I think, and I'll represent Fauda on this uh, panel, if that's okay, and you can represent Assad 101. Um, but I think, and as you know, we kind of took that journey together. We were definitely focused on getting a format deal because who would have thought that you know there'd be a, an audience, let alone an international audience of 250 countries and territories for a show that's half in Hebrew, half in Arabic, that is very, very specific, and to have it resonate, especially Fauda, which I'm gonna plug tomorrow, if that's okay. So that we're premiering tomorrow night, a world premiere of season two, um, to find an audience like that has been unbelievable. I mean, to, you know, for the actors to travel around the world, get recognized wherever they go. I was wondering, has that been your experience? So do you get...
I think before FAUDA, we were kind of known for having great IP, so having great ideas like Homeland, certainly, and in treatment, have those kind of translated or gone through an American system and become American shows. Uh, but I think the last kind of year and a half or so has really broken through for all of us in the sense that, you know, the productions that we make in the language that we make them and in the country where we shoot them actually managed to find such a global audience has been Sharon, awesome. or do they call you Sharon in Israel? You can call me Sharoni. Uh, Sharoni. Uh, <laughs> Why do you think Israeli formats are so successful and in such demand in the U.S.? Um, and what makes Israeli television so interesting that people are watching all over the world? I want to ask both of you and David. You from an Israeli American perspective and David from just a creative perspective. Do you want to start? Sure. You can. Um, something that when you're in this industry, people, even if they're not in this industry, feel this, feel very open to just give you advice whether you've asked for it or not, which is a trait that Israelis tend to share with, with them. Um, and, and a little while ago, somebody came up to me and told me, this is somebody who wasn't in the business, told me what makes a good TV show. And they, they just said, you take reality and then you just exaggerate it a little bit. And that's kind of what Israel is, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and I think when you live in Israel, you live with that. You live with all the regular day-to-day -day stuff that everybody does, but it's just a little more heightened and a little more focused. This is my pet theory for why you're creating so many good dramatic shows, aside from the fact that there's a lot of Jews that live there, um, who in my experience tend to make good writers. Um, they're good storytellers. <laughs> yes. A lot of Bubba mindsets, but they're good storytellers. <laughs> So I think there's just a great, they're good storytellers, you're absolutely right. I mean, it goes, they also, you know, Judaism's uh, history is filled with debates over ethical issues, and that's what drama is too. We're raised to argue about things, and that's what drama is, and so you've got a country filled with people doing that, and that's going to be good. Um, I definitely echo that. I will also say, Israelis are innovators. They're entrepreneurs. Um, it's not a coincidence that we also invented so many things in the tech world. Um, Israelis think out of the box. They never want to repeat someone else's idea or success story. They want to invent and um, push the envelope. They're radical thinkers. They just never want to think safe. And I think that audiences appreciate when ideas, as you said, are exaggerated and are, you know, pushing the envelope. Um, and then I also echo that, you know, Israelis have always something to say and they want to say it. And they say it. Um, <laughs> and lastly, yeah, I, you know, I'm a, a TV executive in, in, in the US and I think, um, you know, just working with, with, you know, Israeli creators in Israel and working with American, um, you know, creators and writers here, um, there's diff just a different, I think, a different vibe um, that you get from an Israeli writer. There's this very honest, very brutal type of approach that they take with you and expect that you take with them. I think that American writers expect you to treat them with gloves and be very, very, very careful. Are you saying Israeli <laughs> writers don't take notes as well? I, I no, they, they, they do, t they'll push for sure, they'll push <laughs> back, um, but they, they appreciate a conversation, they appreciate the feedback and they're not afraid of, they're not afraid of notes actually. Can you guys talk about the difference in the process between creating television shows and the writer's room in Israel and in America? Because it seems to be a big difference. I know there's a big difference budgetarily. Anyone can speak to that. I would like. I need to manage those writer's room. We don't have writer's room in Israel, unfortunately. It's really a, it's a lack. Uh, usually when we start an idea, so it starts with a 
one who comes with an idea and you start brainstorm and brainstorm and you pitch it and then you add some other script writers because when you get the green light you need to do it as quick as possible and to write as quick as possible so we use a, a group of writers that uh, handle the project uh, together with the chief or the main creator sometimes he's also a writer sometimes he just brought the idea but we do not have a writer's room uh, we do it linear we cannot afford ourselves unfortunately to have uh, every day uh, a group of people comes to the office and working together and debate and brainstorm etc and then conclusions um, but still we do this complicated way path and uh, we support all every stage with the right people dialogue script writers storyliners etc and i wish sometime we can have uh, the ability you know to to hire or to budget writers room so it's quite different from what i know happens in david Hollywood. would you ever see yourself going to israel and uh creating a tv show there um why not i mean lama low what's the although you get spoiled with the budgets over here and yeah it would have to be on similar terms but i love israel and i love israelis and i'm not just pandering um i am pandering but pandering i'm not or just pandering, pandering. <laughs> what's that or pandering yeah <laughs> um you you get um because i i need I rewrite everything more than I write. That's what my clients on your shows have told me. <laughs> <laughs> and you get spoiled with that. And so um, I would need to have similar circumstances, but uh, I like the idea of an executive that, that expects me to push back against them. That's um, why you should do something for Amazon with <laughs> your own, because you'll get a good, it'll be a good tug of war between the two of you. I think our compensation about this process is the passion and the moments that you really need to find a clue to something ever, never did. Because as, as we said, both as the box is small, you, you don't have any chance. You need to think out of the box because she's so small. So this is for me the metaphor for the situation. Michael, well, because you're involved in so many formats all over the world, how would you compare the success of Israeli formats to other countries' formats here in the U.S., both from other English-speaking countries and from non-English-speaking countries? I think, as Dana said, the last year and a half has really changed the change format business. Um, before that, you know, Israel obviously did very well um, in terms of change formats and bringing their IP over, but what happened is, due to the fact that we have global streamers, the Anglo countries, specifically the UK, their shows are now being seen everywhere. And so when you do a UK adaptation, there's a, a fear that you've already seen the same show um, on Netflix when it gets adapted. So there becomes a, a higher premium for Western style storytelling with great characters, and no one really does that better than the Israelis. Partially because, you know, there are great writers and storytellers, and the other thing is the population is not homogeneous like it is in Scandinavia. So there's a lot of organic stories that can be told. And Sharon, what would you say, considering you see a lot of formats from all over the world? Um, you mean what other countries and what other formats are working? Or? Right, and like how does Israeli formats compare? Is there, can you make a comparison to I other mean, they're, formats? They're just, you know, they're, they're grouped in a different way, you know, Israel had a lot of success, uh, you know, with Fauda, with um, False Flag, with, um, and, and in treatment and, and, you know, previous projects, um, you know, it was either a relationship-based drama or, you know, spy um, Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I think if you look at the Scandi formats, they're very crime oriented. So a lot of great crime came from Scandinavia. Um, Turkish dramas are, you know, you know, are very, um, in my previous job on, on the global side, um, we sold a lot of the, you know, the, the 
you know, Turkish dramas, the Latin American uh, uh, telenovelas, also for adaptation. But I think in terms of like cable, more again pushing the envelope, I think Israel and Scandinavia are kind of the front leaders. And David, what do you think makes a good format? I just wanted to oh. just put a, a little bit of context as to the, because um, you were talking about Scandinavian and, and UK and Israeli. And just on this fall season, actually there are three Israeli shows on primetime network U.S. television, which I think is a first. I mean, um, one is based on previous IP, the other one's a totally original. One's called uh, Wisdom of the Crowd, the other one's called The Brave, and then uh, Fox is premiering um, the a reality Four, show. a reality show, which is their, which is kind of funny, but their reversioning of uh, American Idol, um, which is their own show. So three primetime Israeli-based um, Format. formats within you know one season, one fall amazing. season. It's amazing. That's and I believe there are two British shows on air, so that goes to show. It's pretty amazing. And and one Korean show. <laughs> uh, what do I think makes a good? Uh, format the same thing that makes a good show. I think one of the really gratifying, if I can get non-Israel specific here, one of the things I think is incredibly gratifying about the globalization of our industry is just the underlying reality that people all around the globe are telling the same stories. That I don't mean they're the same stories, I mean they're all different, but I mean they're all telling universal stories and you, you watch a, a format from, from Turkey and you cry, and you watch a format from Norway and you're scared, and you watch a format from Israel and you see these characters and you care about these characters and you're rooting for them. And that's what it takes to make, make a good show, wherever it's from. Michael, what do you think? To me, it's, it's about giving a, a hook, a thematic characters as a starting point. I think the, the buyers have a tendency to be risk averse and they like to see when something else works elsewhere. And so if you can kind of take a, a piece of something and, and show the visualization to a buyer and then show what it can become through a pitch, that to me is the best way to adapt. Anyone else? I think there's always also a little bit of a segue, but you know, I was confronted when I was developing, you know, Israeli for formats and other formats with the big question of, like, you take Homeland, and that was a big shift in creative when it was adapted by um, or Howard Gordon and the team over here versus other formats that you kind of don't want to change, and the question of, you know, it's not just whether the format worked in its origin country is how would you adapt it here and how would it resonate with audiences without jeopardizing the DNA of the format. Um, and I think there's something about Israeli formats that, I, maybe because we grew up with, you know, living in Israel, we grew up with American television and TV is not dubbed, it's subtitled and so we heard a lot of the English and we consumed a lot of the American culture that I think that a lot of the Israeli formats could be adapted here very easily without a lot of change. Like in treatment. Yeah. Exactly. Some, some of the in treatment episodes they literally just translated the scripts which I guess shows that Israelis talk about the same thing in a therapist's office as Americans. <laughs> the, the, I'll, I'll. The, uh, look, this is not very helpful, what I'm going to say. It's a personal opinion that probably is 180 <laughs> degrees the opposite of the marketplace. Hooks make me nervous. Um, <laughs> look, I, I watched the Korean format of The Good Doctor, and it did have a hook. It had the, the, uh, the doctor with autism. But that's not what I responded to. I responded because that show made me cry. It, it wasn't the big idea. It's about the characters. And, um, but it's difficult to walk into a room and, and give enough of a story and a pitch that, uh, that is going to make somebody cry. You can walk into a room and give a big hook 
Um, but that, that worries me, as I say, because ultimately the show has got to live or die based on the characters and uh, our emotional reaction to those characters. Why is IP so important in the U.S. television market? IP is intellectual property. Not the television's that intellectual. But. In, in my opinion, because they're scared. They're scared of original ideas. If you tell them that something was a hit in Luxembourg, then they can, they, if it fails, they get to tell their boss, but it was a hit in Luxembourg, how could it have failed? I think it's driven by fear. So it's like idiot insurance. I think so. <laughs> what other people think? No, I, I, I said that it's like idiot insurance. You're basically proving it worked somewhere else. And, you know, I think it's interesting that there's so many uh, well-paid writers in America that don't necessarily have their own ideas. And they're looking for formats, they're looking for articles, they're looking for books. And if you look at a television schedule, very, very many shows don't come from the original right. creator's mind. They, they're adapting it. I, I don't think it's always fear coming from the network side. I, I don't think it's always fear. I, I agree that sometimes it is. And when it is, it's, it can result in, you know, in a wrong approach. But sometimes it's inspiration. You watch this, you know, when I watched a very important person, Ish Chashuv Meod, and fell in love with that property when I was at Fox, there was nothing safe about it. Thinking, you know, who could do Yuda Levy's role here in the US was a big challenge. So to me, sometimes there, it's just inspiration, and you think, what can I do with this here? Same thing as you read a book. You know, uh, I'm sure when Fincher read Gone Girl and got excited, th that there was nothing safe about it. It was inspiring. Um, so yeah. I tend to think that, and this is, I hope I don't offend anyone, but you guys kind of live in a bubble here in this Us? industry. Us? LA is a bubble? It's not the real world? <laughs> Come on. Uh, I don't know. I saw a press conference today of the president of uh, the other country that isn't California and definitely not LA. Um, I, I, oh, come on. Um, you know, I, I, I think, and this is an outsider's kind of view, a lot of the industry, and I don't know what the statistics are, but the scrub writers all seem to live, you know, in like a big city in a big bubble and, and kind of you know, hang out in the same places and need it. Okay, maybe not fear is not the only reason, okay? <laughs> We're not coming in with enough good ideas. And it's true that, you know, if you watch a format, you're going to get a lot more information than somebody will give in a 20-minute pitch. But it does seem like, you know, I don't know what the reason is, but it is definitely true when you go in with, with a format, whether it's a book or, or a TV show, the doors seem to be much more open. David, are you working with the original Korean creator at all on your, your show? No. And do you think you're missing something, or do, it's so different over there that it, doesn't, it wouldn't have been helpful here? Apparently, I'm not missing anything. <laughs> that's an asshole joke, sorry. Uh, um, I almost adapted Zaguri Empire a couple years ago. I remember, it's a great show. And it's a great show, and I would have never wanted to do that without, without him, without Maor Zagori. I think he's brilliant, and what he brought to that I thought was brilliant, and I was excited about working with him. This was, a, this was just a different situation. And did you ever come into contact with the creator, or was not even...? I have not met the creator of the Korean series. There's also such a difference in the societies. Mm -hmm between the two countries, that you can understand that. When I try and work with uh, Israeli formats here, I try and bring the creator in if I can, if there's not too much of a language barrier, because I think that if the show is successful enough in Israel to make us want to do it here, there should be something that that person can contribute to help work with the creator here, but every situation is different. I've also been involved with shows where They've had zero input, and somewhere they have had little input, and somewhere they've had a lot. I think it, it all depends, but I think, David, one thing you can say as a creator is that I know you respect the process and the artists from wherever they come from, and 
and obviously we're all in this business is something that we all do and you know we're very thankful for the artistic talent that people have all over the world that they can bring to us because everyone wants to be in Hollywood and that we can take their projects and try and make them successful here and I know that um, for the Israelis that I work with it's you know something very exciting to them as well is there anything anyone else wants to say or talk about before we open it up to questions? Because you guys are so talkative. In concluding, would you want to each say something? Just to say the final thought about this panel. Uh, I think as we spoke before about Hollywood and living in the States, uh, it's of course, every population, every culture, has its, every nation has its own problems. But uh, maybe I think that it's, it's very so small place and so tense, and you need to be not less than excellent if you want to step ahead. So I think that's natural. Only the really good, good, good and unique ideas um, making progress to the screen. Sorry. That's, that's what I feel with every new idea that we start working on him. It needs to be really with the heart and with the beat, unless it's spread between the Megirot. I do have one thing to say is that, Megirot. Adam, your approach about involving Israeli writers here um, is great because if you don't, they'll just move here and try to make a career. <laughs> so before we lose all the writers in Israel, um, I do hope that other people take your approach. Thank you. Anything you want to say? I just want to say that some of them already moved. So. A yeah, lot of them. It, there is a big migration, which should stop. <laughs> Michael? Just the, with the, we now have five global networks. And so with that, people can tell great stories from anywhere. And so as we're kind of talking about migration patterns of where to live, you know, as the Israeli television market is maturing and, and people are able to produce at such a high level, there's something to be said for making really great stories where you are at and, and it, will, it will travel if it's good. Thank you, Dana. totally agree and I would hate to see all of our writers and directors and I know you're trying to sign some of them this week so stop. Not be Tom. Not be Tom. Not Um And um, I think there's a lot to be said about living as Udi said, you know, with a lot of passion, rawness to it, you know, hardship tends to make good art and, you know, And good struggle. people. And, and and good people, and I would like to see that continue. I don't think, you know, we're doing well by living whatever 15 and a half hour flight from here. I think we're getting our voices across. I think we're getting business done, and I would encourage that. So keep us in the madhouse where it's hot and we're passionate, and uh, buy our stuff. Thank you, David. Anything you want to say? Um, I hate summing up because I. I in spite of Twitter, I don't believe any wisdom can be summarized in 140 characters. So, I think it's 280 now. Oh, it's yeah. 280. Maybe you can get wisdom in 280. So I, I just want to say thank you. I, I want to say thank you to Israeli television. I've, I've enjoyed it over the years. I want to say thank you to the people on the panel for their contributions to it and the people in the audience who have contributed because uh, even for the hour before this, I was, I was hugely entertained and you've hugely entertained me and I'm grateful for that. I want to say thank you to everyone also because I found a passion in my job that I love that also, and I love helping people and I love Israelis and not all Israelis <laughs> and the country in spite of the government um, and oh, it's, it's exciting to come to houses. work and be able to do what I do and help the people that I care about and it's, I get a lot of nachos out of it. Low. Low shot. Sharon? No, just to say that if you don't know who Adam Berkovitz is, he is the ambassador of yeah. Israel in Hollywood. Um, Thank you. And we suspect Oda. that he might move to Israel 
And then... <laughs> I wouldn't be worth anything to anyone in Israel. I just have to visit. Thank, Thank you. you, Adam. Thank you all for your time. It really it means a lot to me that you're willing to come up here and, um, and share your experiences with us. I know you're all very busy people and I'm um, touched about that. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs>